my NDE as um, a person who um, was in July 16th, 1982. And believe me, I wish I'd known many of you back then, but I didn't know ions existed. I didn't even know that anyone had had an out-of-body experience or anything to call it. I didn't know a term. I knew no one. And I felt very isolated when I came out of my NDE. And so as you see just on there that I went from my NDE growing hugely and then down to what he's terming crisis and then back up growing some more and then back down for crisis. And I keep thinking that for those of you that have had near-death experiences, I bet you could avoid some of those crises that I'm going to share a little bit about my personal life to let you know what it is that I really could have done differently. But in the beginning, my NDE was due to a terrible car accident that I was in with my two young children, and that scream, those screams never leave your body memory. And I was transported to a local hospital in Shelbyville, Tennessee. And while they were trying to figure out desperately what was wrong, of course, they were stitching me up, making t worried about a head injury, and, but they knew something internal and was going on, but in 82, no MRIs. So it was figuring that out. And in the meantime, I was bleeding internally, and slowly my spleen was rupturing. And when it did rupture, it was just an explosion inside my body, as my doctor described it. And I was in the searing, terrible pain that whole time. And all of a sudden, I'm just absolutely feeling wonderful, marvelous, and calm and serene. But I'm looking down on my body. And it took me a while to say, oh, my goodness, that's, that's me. Uh, but I was thinking very logically. And this is one of the things that I began to process right away. It was my mind was operating perfectly well. I looked down, and it was, they had found my own doctor. And I remember thinking, wow, you found my own doctor <laughs> by now. How did that happen? But in the end, my experience was looking down and remembering every detail. And it would be later, it was almost three months later before I got a nerve to say to my doctor, I saw this and you were saying this. And the team that came in to resuscitate me, I could tell you how many were there and many details about what happened in the room. And then I was getting a larger picture of my husband who had been called to come get my young children after they had been checked out. And they found him and he was at a, someone's house. I knew what house, I knew where he was. I knew my children were okay, and I was getting a much larger picture. As I moved up into the cloud, like formations that were coming in front of me, because the fading picture was fading fairly quickly at that point in time, and I was perfectly calm. I was absolutely feeling in, in a static state of feeling euphoria. And I was absorbed into those clouds, and the stories are very similar to so many of yours that the little details are not as important as what happened later. So as so I put the continuum on there just to show you that the time being altered and that voiceless voice information just flooding in, but eventually as I was getting closer to that white light, I began hearing sounds, and those sounds were getting more and more clarity. They were large beautiful, beautiful singing. Music has been a part of my life, still is a part of my life hugely. And I was hearing just amazing sounds, and I was beginning to see illuminating colors that I'd never seen. And I was describing those colors, they're so different, that I wasn't sure if those were beings or just what th that was, because at that point in time when I came back into my body, I was trying to sort the whole thing out, let alone what it was I saw for a while. Later, I began to figure things out. As I got into that light, I was totally absorbed with no body. I mean, there's no sense of the body, but my words when I came back were, you know, love is all there is. I couldn't stop saying those words. I kept saying, you know, the no judgment, and yet I had seen my, my life in a map in front of me, but there, it was never with any kind of judgment, and it was through such loving kindness that I really saw it very quickly, actually, and it sounded, mine sounded so short to some of you other people that I thought, oh, wow, I wish I'd gotten a little more detail, but I'm afraid I can't say that happened to me, and in that white light, 
you know, I heard I was coming back. I had things I needed to do. I did not want to come back either. I was perfectly content to be in that light, but I never really individually figured out who these beings were that near, were nearby, but I was absorbed completely in that white light. And I came back saying to people, we don't have just five senses, and I know we've heard of the six, but we have 12, maybe it's 14. And I was trying to describe to people what it was that, I, that you, we can hear with our eyes and we can see with our body and we can, you know, that whole memory piece was so crystal clear in me. But as I came back in my body, it, I needed major surgery. And the, the hospital where I was could not handle it. They sent me to Baptist Hospital in Nashville, Tennessee. And I only had blocked memory for eight days after that. I don't know the answer to why. Some of those memories have come back in a tiny way. But my near-death experience is absolutely crystal, crystal clear. I was in the middle of the Bible Belt. And I, in Shelbyville, Tennessee, which Michigan is my home, and I returned there, and I had lived in many places prior to this. So, but I want to get to what really happened and what happened afterwards because mine was a long journey. The doctor was shocked three months later when I told him the details. And because he had been a personal friend in some ways, too, he played golf with my husband, he, he said, it confirmed and said, when he heard the details, how did you know that? And it was like, because I was watching you and I was listening and I was hearing. And he, he just said, but, but you couldn't, you couldn't. And I asked if I was gone because that was what was important to me. I know, need to know, was I gone? And he said, yes, you were. But how could you know that? <laughs> and uh, so anyway, we had an interesting conversation. More of that is in my book. But what began to happen is I ran away, as you saw that runner back there. I, my body was healing so quickly. That's what brought up the discussion with the doctors. But I had one foot in one world and another foot in another world. I, for three months, literally felt like I was now what I would might recognize as really deep meditation and staying there because I wanted to stay in that world. <laughs> and then the other part of me was pretending that everything was going to be okay and then I was healing. And I, and I know that I was healing fast and I was hearing messages about the healing part of our body, of, of the fact that our body is this amazing instrument that has healing capabilities that we will understand someday. And so I was, that was information I thought, what do I know about the medical field? I'm a, a teacher. I was a science major, so I was very much interested in the science after this, but I was busy running away. We sold our home. I convinced my husband of that, <laughs> and, and we eventually worked our way back to Michigan because I was not fitting into what the world seemed to be about me, and so I moved back to Michigan I had a third child by then, so I thought, oh, that's part of what I came back. I, I, that third child was very important in my life and still is terribly important. But my world opened up, opened up once I began to d realize that I was very excited about going with my middle school st son, who I was going to be traveling as a teacher, along with a classroom of students going to, not a classroom, uh, a group of students from our area going to the Amazon, and this was in 1992. Not many youth travelers had gone into the Amazon, and we were way remote outside of Iquitos down the Amazon into um, very uh, camps with no electricity and those kind of things. But my world opened up. I had sent everything inward, totally inward, and I only t shared my experience with so few people. But I opened up down there. All of a sudden, I was, I was comfortable with these people. Everybody else was fearful, and I kept saying, oh, but there's nothing to be afraid of, and there's nothing that you need to worry about. God is absolutely wonderful, and we are going to, you know, I kept being such this positive person, probably a little bit too much, and saying, you know, oh, we really need to be afraid of these snakes. Yeah, well, you know, yes, we do need to be afraid of these. I mean, we need to put that fear where it belonged, take out the fear where it didn't belong. And I was busy trying to make everybody feel wonderful. Well, my world opened up. 
I realized down there, once I started talking, it was like, oh, yeah, oh, you need to talk to this person. They've had an experience just like that. And these are, I found these stories were very common down there. And then I was experiencing for 10 years, because I have to make this really short, but for 10 years, then an organization was formed, and my husband and I were doing this together, along with many other health people, bringing students from actually all over the United States and Canada, going in and out of the Amazon, in, in Cusco, Peru, walking the Inca Trail. I, I hiked the Inca Trail 10 times, and into Kenya eventually, and Costa Rica in the Arctic. And one of the things that happened to me during that time is I found myself. I found I, my voice. I found my ability to tell people what really happened during that NDE. And much like Evan Alexander talks about and you're talking about, I had a view of the world that wasn't fitting. Oh, I was a science major, and I was teaching rainforest ecology to middle schools students and high school students, and I had had the physics, but quantum physics just was never on my plate. And I realized I needed to know about the world. So I began doing the research into the science end of it. Never found ions. <laughs> it, wasn't until, it wasn't until the early 90s when I even found a book. Then a book became 10, and then came 40, came 60, and I just was absorbing everything I could on the topic, but I hadn't found ions yet. It was actually Wayne Dyer, who I took many of his um, workshops at Hay House, I Can Do It, but also Writing From Your Soul, because I had decided that I needed to write that. And, and he said, have you found ions? And it's like, no, <laughs> please tell me. And then I found you. But I was that person behind the computer read, 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 thousands and thousands of stories later, I'm like, oh my. It, it backing up here, um, whoops, I can't back up too far. Something happened. That. <laughs> I must have hit a button because that is not it. That's all right, I'll just talk. Um, if, unless somebody wants to come look at that. Um, you know, because I do have some significant slides. But there was one in there of me of, with a lady in Kenya. And one of the things that happened to me is that she, b besides, um, yeah, be besides, um, back up one more, one more, just, okay, and then I'm going to go quickly. Um, it, because what happened was I opened up, but this lady came right to me. Can I use you? <laughs> And, and it, I was in a Maasai village, and we were hearing all of these amazing things through an interpreter, but that interpreter was everywhere. And this lady came walking up to me, and she just had her eyes right on me and came and just looked right in my eyes. And it was like, you know, I greeted her, said hello, but we couldn't communicate in our language. And that was the first time I ever had the experience where I was, we were communicating almost telepathically. She, I could, I could hear and feel her thoughts, and I know she was doing the same thing with me, even though I was using language she didn't understand, and she was using language I didn't, but we realized we didn't need it after a while. And the picture of her and I together was because she then followed me around the whole rest of the time we're in the village, and I felt like this connection and that piece of understanding that came with it, we're all connected, that was mapped out in front of me when, when, during my NDE, and I was so connected with people all over the world. But what happened to me is I was still keeping it inward, and that was another crisis. <laughs> Here I am in that crisis because I was two different people. Here's my professional life of teaching. Here's my life that I could open to down here, but not at home. I hit bottom with a terrible, terrible health crisis, and I can't go into the detail because it's not really time, but they... It diagnosed me with, with multiple sclerosis, with MS, because they didn't know what else. Eventually, five different specialists sent everything to Mayo Clinic and found that it was something called he hemoplegic migraines, and that, it's got a big, long name, um, where, which was attacking my head and uh, the body organs, and one by one, they were attacking my heart, my, oh, <laughs> any of the our organs that are in this part of our body, moving out of my body, leaving my right side numb like a stroke and I was losing control over my muscle body. I went through the whole gamut of medicine, 
And I dissolved on my yoga mat one, more, one day where I said, you know, I didn't come back from the living, or to be in the, within the living, in a, in a place of not understanding why I wasn't healing and what was going on with my body because it happened so suddenly. And in that moment, that was that, uh, the first real booming voice I heard. And I had many mystical experiences in the Amazon, and I wrote them in my story because they're very unusual, some of them. And spirit communication with me was not unusual, and I was realizing my gifts, but I was not taking them on. I denied them. You know, like I said, I was a slow learner here. <laughs> and, but tragedy strikes all of us, and in the midst of all of that, this is part of what crashed me, I'm sure. And this is my sister Marge, who lost her 19-year-old daughter, that's Anne, next to her, my niece, who I was very close to. I was going to be taking her on, a tr on a, one of our experiences in the Amazon. I never got her there. And it was tragic for our whole family. It was tragic for my sister, of course. But it opened doors that we never, ever would have thought. And one of them was, okay, Terry, open your mouth. Your family only knows minute details. You need to tell it all. And I did, and I began talking. And my sister, I kept saying, Anne is here. She's around. She's not, she's not gone, gone. She's gone to this wonderful place. She just opened a new door. And there she is, and she's going to be fine. But it was a tragic accident. They never knew. Falling from an eight-story building in England on a trip that she was with a college band. And she fell out of that. Not, not then parents didn't know whether it was a fall, a suicide, or, or foul play for a very, very long time. We connected in ways. It opened up a door. I had a premonition of her death. I was busy before she left on this trip for almost a month, calling people and say, asking Anne, are you okay? I, I just feel like something's wrong. Calling relatives and saying, would you please invite Anne over? Because... I just feel like there's something wrong, and I don't know what. The day she died, <clears throat> my sister is calling the family home, and we just happened to be there with our three children. And when the phone rang, it was, I knew Anne was dead. Never want to have that kind of <laughs> permission. No, nobody does, but I did. And when I answered the telephone, I had to say, I, my, my, she's screaming in the phone, my sister. And said, oh, I'm so glad it's you. I just, and she's screaming. And I said, Margie, it's okay. It's okay. I know. I know. And, and she said, you can't know. You can't know. And I said, I know she's dead, Margie. I, you know, I'll hit, let's go through. And I thought, what a thing to say to someone who's so out of control and in shock. I, I felt guilty for that, about that for years. But in the end, she was the beginning of she was my first spirit visitation that I had where I actually saw a human, per I mean, a human spirit is all of us, our human body, our spirit body, and I talk about our energy body too because um, I experienced learning about my energy body very quickly after with a lot of very <laughs> entertaining almost things of how I could find out the types of things that I was affecting. And <clears throat> the, her spirit visitation was the first where she jumped on my bed with her dog, who died four months later. She was talking. She was smiling. She looked beautiful. And, of course, when she, I, she's telling me, I'm fine. I'm wonderful. Please let my mom know that I'm fine. And my, my, my dad just can't even handle it. Please give these messages and tell her about the green bag. Tell her she'll, she'll ha that'll help mo settle mom's mind. So afterwards, I'm waking my husband, and then I'm thinking, well, that is really interesting, too, because I'm thinking, okay, Doug, <laughs> of course, he'd lived through a lot with me, shaking and shaking him and saying, y you know, Anne was here, Anne was here, wake up, you've got to, you've got to, you know, and, and of course, he hadn't seen any of it, so then you begin to doubt a little bit, but believe me, it was a visitation, and it was so clear, it was, it was a beautiful moment for me, and it began opening doors, because I finally let the belief move in. I knew I had heard from spirits and things in the Amazon and in Machu Picchu but, but, and in Kenya. But honestly, I still just didn't let myself believe it. And if you, any of you who have had these near-death experiences, just don't doubt yourself. Absolutely, that's what was wrong with me. And, I, and, and 
open up because had I opened up much earlier, my life could have been very different, I think. But be, keeping it inside of me was one of the hardest things. When my life flooded and I was very sick, that spirit that woke me up and said, at the end, I, like I said, I dissolved on my mat. I was so angry and upset and what is wrong? And a very loud voice came in my ear and said, Terry, you know how to heal. Do it. And I just was, I, I actually literally jumped up and thought, okay, now who said that? <laughs> and from that moment after that, I began getting little things about how, go learn how to meditate better. You're, you're meditating, but you don't get it. <laughs> and another one was, you know, fine, Qigong. Well, I didn't even know what it was. I had, I, these were, I was hearing things to go do, but then books and things fell in my lap, and very significant things fell in my lap to learn by. My sister was feeding me a lot of it. People, I, a book would be given to me, and it would be just what I had asked for or information about. And I, I, I found that the understanding how to integrate all of these things that were happening to me in my life so that I could be human spirit and that energy body all at the same time and make life pleasant. That's what we're supposed to be doing. <laughs> and we're supposed to enjoy life. And I be, finally, when I let myself integrate everything I knew and be able to talk to people, it opened doors that I had no idea would open. And I found that people were not as afraid to hear these things. Oh, I got some real choice comments back. Believe me, I got that too. <laughs> uh, from, uh, you know, and, and really, for the most part, I, I found it interesting that the most fanatic or, you know, totally Christian people that were around me were one of some of the amazing worst comments I got. But when I opened myself up and talked to my own community, I was well known as a teacher because I had worked from not only helping students, but helping teachers because I put my love into kids. I love the teaching. And I found that I had an amazing intuition and in how to work with them. I knew what to do. That was a very successful part of my life. It was the other part that wasn't. So integrating it was what I needed to do. And now that I have, my life has turned around just 200%. Now, I am, this happened when I was 32, and I'm now 69. You can do the math. But it is, you know, so it took me a lot of years. <laughs> and when I was reading uh, the Atwood's uh, manual for humans, I thought, oh boy, do I fit into that? You know, right at the end of each of your categories <laughs> is uh, there's me at the end of all of those because it just, it took me that long. And I know that for some of you, it's taken you a long time, too. And not only that, but we're hard on ourselves. The last person, I loved everybody. I had no problem. Parents that I had to work with, with which some of them were the most difficult people to work with, and people in my building would say, you're don't doing what? You're going to their home? And I said, you know, we've got to meet them where they are. They're troubled people. They need us. And they'd say, oh, you know, <laughs> you know, take a yes, so I need to stop. But anyway, um, I just wanted to say thank you. And also, just grow with what you know about yourself. And don't...